So I'm supposed to now do a biblical teaching. <laughs> so it's amazing. I uh, love <clears throat> being put in that position to make this transition. So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we're excited that you guys are, are here with us today on July 18th, 2021, which just so happens to be my 33rd birthday. And so here I am. I, uh, I made it another year. And, uh, you know, birthdays have always been interesting in my family. Uh, at the 9 a.m. service, my sister Carrie was here, uh, my oldest sister Carrie, and she came all the way up from Alabama with her whole family uh, this weekend for my birthday, which is, which is uh, really cool. And the reason I mention her is because uh, 33 years ago today, I had the audacity to be born on her fourth birthday. <laughs> and so she is four years older than me, but we have the same birthday, which as adults is really cool, but you have to imagine that for her as a child, that was very, very annoying. Like your birthday is supposed to be the day that everybody pays attention to you and all eyes are on you. And on that day, here comes this just devastatingly adorable baby <laughs> that steals all the attention and all the shine. And so, like, I came into this world annoying my older sisters, and I don't know how the formation of subconsciousness works, but there's something about that that, like, I've taken that call very seriously throughout the rest of my life, and I'm very, very good at it. And so she's here with her kids, and, and uh, Mac is, uh, her son, is three, and Georgia is seven, so they're at, like, an awesome age to play, and I'm the uncle, and so what I get to do is I get to, to play with them and you know, work them up to this like frothing state that can't be sustained. And when the emotional breakdown happens, I'm like, Carrie, take your kids, something's wrong with them. <laughs> I don't know what happened. She's like, this is very helpful. Thank you for, for this. So I even get to like do this today, like to annoy my sisters. And I orchestrated this weekend perfectly because not only did she come all the way to my city where I live for our birthday, but she came to the church that I work at. And unbeknownst to her, uh, she actually had to sit here and listen to me speak in a monologue fashion for 40 minutes. And it was like, what better gift could she want? And so I've been thinking all year of what gift to give her, and I, th I think it was perfect, and I think it worked out well. Now, now the, the truth is, when you talk about birthdays in our culture, like for me, getting older, I don't necessarily yet have a negative disposition towards the passage of time and getting older. You know, a lot of people as they move into their 30s, it kind of seems like they start to lament the idea of getting older. And I don't really have that yet because I look back at my life and there's not really a time that I wish I could go back to, at least not without knowing the things that, that I feel like I know now. And so I don't really have a negative disposition towards that. But it is true that as you get older and as you start to see the markers of time pass and as you start to be able to look back at your life, and see what has happened, there are certain existential questions that get intensified. And for me personally, I've always been somebody who's been uh, very self-reflective about the questions of meaning and purpose. You know, what am I supposed to be, and what am I supposed to do, and who am I supposed to become? Always been really important to me. And at, hopefully, you know, as I've come to know Christ, and as I've tried to step into this relationship of following Jesus, um, you know, those moments have, have, have made me kind of change that question a little bit. You know, all of us wrestle with these questions of meaning and purpose. You can't run away from it. In order to live in this world, you have to have meaning, you have to have purpose. If you can't see it in front of you, you will go somewhere to try to find it. And as a follower of Jesus, those questions have changed over time, but they haven't gone away. Instead of the question being, you know, who am I supposed to be and what am I supposed to do? As a disciple of Jesus, I think that the question changes to what does God want with my life? You, know, you think about where you've come from. You think about the time you have left in front of you. And the question starts to come up in your mind, what does God want with me? What does he want with my life? And as we think about the story of scripture, and we actually believe that that's a story that isn't just something that happened, it's something that we get to step into and participate in. I, I think that the answer to the question is somewhat simple, at least in terms of giving us an answer. I think that what God wants from every single person in this room who calls themselves a Christian, uh, what he wants from my life, what he wants from all of us, is he wants us to be resilient disciples in the world today, right here, right now. He wants us to become resilient disciples of Jesus Christ, right now. Now, let me unpack what I mean by that. To be a disciple, um, it comes from a Greek word, mathetes, which is where mathematics comes from. It means to learn. But in the Hebrew tradition, 
to be a disciple is not just to learn from a teacher or a rabbi, which means teacher in Hebrew. It's not just to learn from him, it's to learn how to be like him. And so there's this old Hebrew idiom where there's a rabbi and there's a disciple, and a disciple is supposed to be covered in the dust of his rabbi. And what that means is that the the disciple follows his teacher around so closely, emulating everything he does, that the teacher is actually kicking up dust onto the disciple. And so the disciple is supposed to follow so closely that he's covered in the dust of his teacher. And as disciples of Christ, this is the kinds of disciples that we are. You know, you think about when uh, John chapter 20, Christ has resurrected, the tomb is empty, and Mary goes to the tomb and it's empty, she's crying. Jesus is behind her, she doesn't recognize him. He says, why are you crying? And she says, they've taken away my Lord, I don't know where they've put him. And he says, Mary, and she turns and she looks at him, she realizes it's him and she says, Rabboni, which is the, the Aramaic for, for rabbi. So this is our relationship, this is what it means. And we make a strange claim as Christians that says that all of us, our rabbi is Jesus which means that all of us, to one degree or another, are supposed to uh, live lives of formation where we become like him. You know, it's not just that we believe he exists or that we believe God exists or we believe the biblical story is true. It's that we are to take our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our bodies, and we are to put all of our effort and all of our worship into becoming like our teacher, like Jesus. We're supposed to be covered in his dust because we're following him so closely in our attempt to become like him. And so uh, that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ in this world. Now the reason I put resilient in front of it is because nobody ever said this was gonna be easy. And sometimes we make a mistake. You know, we tend to think of the gods that are presented before us and we read the stories of the Old Testament, we see the unfaithfulness and we, we're, we can't believe that they would do that. And we say, man, these, these, they have no faith. And that's not true, you know, the the reality is that the gods that are here, the ones who want our worship, every, every moment we face this decision of if we give our worship to Christ or if we turn away and give it to something else, these are shiny gods. These are tempting gods. These are gods that are promising salvation in some way, shape, or form. And in the moment, the gods that are presented before us uh, seem more expedient than, fall, than the long arc, slow arc of following Jesus. So you think about money, you think about power, you think about status, you think about respect. All of those things seem much more expedient to bring uh, the blessings we want in our life than to follow Jesus. And so these Gods are tempting. And so when I say we need to become resilient disciples of Christ, we need to become people who are like Jesus but are in the world with our feet firmly planted on the ground, able to stare down the gods that come before us and to say, there is no king but Jesus and there is no one who gets my worship except Christ himself. To become resilient disciples of Jesus. One of the ways that this looks is what we named our church after, 514 Church, right? This is from Matthew 514. This is the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we read that verse before I came out here. And uh, Jesus comes in his ministry and it says that he preaches the gospel. And for Jesus, the gospel or the good news or in Greek it's euangelion, the gospel is that the kingdom of God is here with me, Jesus. And so you can turn from what you're doing now, right now in this world, and you can step into the kingdom and participate in the kingdom of God that I'm bringing forth. And so the Sermon on the Mount is his teaching that unpacks who's invited into this kingdom and what this kingdom actually looks like when you participate in it. And so Matthew chapter five, starting in verse 13, he starts to to look at this and he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put her under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. According to Jesus, the the teacher that we're supposed to become like to be a disciple in this world, it looks like being salt and it looks like being light. These are the analogies that he uses. In his book, Here Are Your Gods, biblical scholar Christopher J.H. Wright says that both light and salt have transforming impact on their surroundings. 
Light dispels darkness and salt stems putrefaction or the putrefying of meat. Jesus was challenging his followers to have a comparable dynamic impact on their surroundings through penetrating engagement combined with radical distinctiveness. And so I love, I love that combination, holding those two things in tension and understanding that the call of the Christian is to be both of those simultaneously, penetratingly engaged in culture and yet radically distinct from the world because we worship a different God. To be penetratingly engaged in culture, it, it means to be out in the world. You know, we're not supposed to be sheltered or cloistered away. We're not supposed to be only with other Christians. We're not supposed to only be around people who believe the same things as us. The point of light is to let it shine in darkness. And so you have to go out there and you have to be engaged in the world in a transformative way. You're not supposed to separate yourself from what's out there, no matter what it looks like. The call of the Christians to be penetratingly engaged, and yet we are not supposed to compromise, and we cannot worship those gods. And so we're penetratingly engaged, and yet our feet are firmly planted on the ground, and we are different. Wright goes on to say, when he talks about radical distinctiveness, when there is no distinction in conduct between Christians and non-Christians, for example, in the practice of corruption and greed, or sexual promiscuity, or consumeristic lifestyles, or social prejudice, then the world is right to wonder if our Christianity, and therefore our Christ, makes any difference at all. Our message carries no authority to a watching world. So this is penetrating engagement in the world, shining light, being salt, helping to be a transforming impact in the world, and yet being radically distinct. This means being out there and being compelling. You know that your life is supposed to be compelling to people? Like you as a person are supposed to be compelling? Sometimes I wanna take Christians and shake them and say, you're supposed to be compelling. Like people are supposed to look at you and they're supposed to want that. You're not supposed to operate from fear. You're not supposed to operate from antagonism and your, your view of the world ought not ever be us versus them. You're supposed to be in the world because you're supposed to transform the world. That's why you're here. That's why you're the church. And yet, you're going to be distinct from the world because you do not worship those gods. And that's gonna show. And so penetrating engagement combined with radical distinctiveness. Tim Mackey in the Bible Project, uh, when he's talking about living a life in exile, he says we are to have soft hearts and steel spines. Supposed to have soft hearts in the world, loving the world, co-suffering, sacrificial, self-emptying love, real and costly love, even for our enemies, and yet steel spines. We do not compromise, and we will not worship those gods. And those two things simultaneously make us resilient disciples in this world who, who, who according to the scriptures, have the ability to, to transform and, and build for the kingdom of God right here and right now. And I think that, you know, where I want to take us today is the book of Daniel. I think that this is the best example of the Bible of living a life like this, a life that shows these two things happening simultaneously, not one, not the other, but resilient discipleship simultaneously. This book is essentially about um, uh, four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who get taken from Jerusalem, their people, their temple, where they believe their God lives, and they get exiled all the way over to Babylon, a different empire with different gods, with different power structures, with different worship, and they get sent over there in order to be assimilated into the culture, and it's a story of what happens and, and what it looks like. Now, historically speaking, what happened is that there was a regional war between the empire of Babylon and the empire of Egypt, and so if you think about it on a map, it's kind of like this. And there's a bunch of nation states or tribes or kingdoms like the people of God and the Canaanites that are in between them. And so when you find yourself in between a global battle, you have to choose sides. And you give your allegiance and you give your tribute to one of the two sides. And uh, the king of, of, of Judah, um, Jehoiakim, gives his allegiance to Egypt. And so when Babylon defeats Egypt... 
Babylon turns and goes through these little vassal states and makes sure that that never happens again. And so they come into Jerusalem and they sack the temple. There's probably lots of violence and they take the, the best bread and the most intelligent and the most well-educated men from the royal lineage and they send them to Babylon in order to be assimilated into Babylonian culture. It's called you know, uh, human capital. So when you defeat a, a rival nation, it's not always wise to kill everybody because you could take the best and the brightest and maybe turn them to your side so that they can serve the king and serve the empire. And so this is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they get sent to Babylon for this very reason. In Daniel chapter one, starting in verse six, it says this. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to, Han to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So this is the first step in um, assimilation. You erase the Hebrew identity with their name and you give them a Babylonian name and you start the process of Babylonian assimilation. Uh, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with royal food and wine and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. And so if you read the, the Old Testament, you see that the people of God, one of the most distinctive things about them is that they have a bizarre diet. They, they don't eat all of the protein and the food that's available, which when you live in a desert where there's lots of famine and droughts, that, that's a significant thing to not eat all of the protein and food that's available to you or that you could have. And yet this was a cultural marker. This, this defined them to some degree and it defined obedience and worship of God. And so here's Daniel uh, being sent to be groomed to be in the halls of power of Babylon and he won't even compromise on this seemingly arcane thing like, like a diet. And this is how he goes about doing it. He says this starting in, in uh, verse 12. Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink and then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. And so he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And at the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And so you want to talk about what it looks like to be a resilient disciple, penetrating engagement, okay? Not only are they in Babylon... They are in the halls of power. And yet the king of essentially the world, right, the most powerful man in the world, Nebuchadnezzar, he looks at them and he says, there's something about them that's light. I want them around. I want them with me. There's something about these kids that I love. I want them here. And yet radical distinctiveness at the same time, they won't even eat his food. They will not give up their rhythms and their patterns of worship to their God. And, and you look at that, and, and not only are they doing this, but they're, they're doing this with wisdom and strategy, you know? And you have to remember that these are teenage boys. They're teenage kids. Like, I remember what I was like when I was a teenager, and I was an idiot. And nobody would look at me and say, now that is a strategic, wise, discerning, solid disciple of Christ. And yet here are these kids taken from their home in violence, sent all the way to Babylon into the halls of power, and they're standing there being compelling, being light, transformative, even to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and yet radically distinct in the first thing that comes their way in terms of food. We'll not eat this food because that is not how we serve our God. And the story gets even crazier as you go to Daniel chapter 3. This is a story that many of us know from when we were kids. This is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and the blazing furnace. And so King Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden statue of himself and tries to make everybody worship it. This is what it says starting in verse 4. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. 
As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And so here these young kids are faced with death. Now you have to remember that they were stolen from their land and taken. They know what Nebuchadnezzar will do. They probably watched him do it to their close friends and family, people they loved. They know what this means. They know he's not playing. They know this is real. And yet they refuse to fall down and worship the idol. And Nebuchadnezzar hears about this and he's probably thinking, you know, I took these kids and, and I spared their lives and I gave them positions of power and I treated them with favor and they're gonna disrespect me like this. And so starting in verse 13, it says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so these young men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now, Right now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. No harm, no foul. Call it even. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. This is the most important part. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. You just read this and you're like, whoa. Whoa faced with death, knowing who this is, they stand in front of him and they say, yeah, we're not actually gonna argue with you. You're the king, you can do what you want. Uh, but just so you know, Mr. Most Powerful Man in the World, um, we will not serve your gods and we will not worship your images. And they get thrown into the fire. And so you wanna talk about um, being the light about transformative engagement in the world. You know, they actually come out of the fire unscathed. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar is trying to make them bow down and worship his gods. They come out of the fire unscathed. He sees them healthy and alive. And Nebuchadnezzar himself falls on his knees and worships their God, he worships Yahweh. It's like a, it's, it's a moment where you're like, whoa. And you see this kind of resilient disciple Teenage boys acting like this. And you're like, where did these kids come from? Like, how did they become like this? Because the question that it begs, you know, if we're supposed to be resilient disciples, how do we become resilient disciples? You see these examples of these, these teenage boys that are, that are living this life. And it's like, where did they come from? How did they learn to be like this? How did that happen? And one of the beautiful things about the scripture being a story is that you can sometimes trace these seemingly unanswerable questions and you can kind of figure out where they came from. And when you go to the, uh, the book of First and Second Kings, it's kind of a tough read, but they're like the chronicle of all of the kings of, of the people of God. And generally speaking, it's a story of unfaithfulness. You know, the kings are bringing in false gods and the people are worshiping these false gods and that's one of the main reasons they get exiled away. Uh, but there are some good kings. And about 12 years before Nebuchadnezzar comes in, it's the last good king of Judah. And his name's Josiah. And you can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 22. And Josiah institutes this program of like radical reform. And so he remains faithful to God. And it says that he finds the book of the law, which is like the Torah, like they recover it. Apparently it's been missing for hundreds of years. The instruction book on how to be like, they find it. He brings it in front of the people. He reads it to them. He brings them together. He renews the covenant. They make new promises to God about faithfulness. They, they, they tear down um, the, the idols in the high places where they worship Canaanite gods, including what is called the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, which is what Jesus refers to as Gehenna. 
And so this is Jesus' analogy of hell. This was a valley south of Jerusalem where the Canaanites used to sacrifice their children to a god named Molech. And the Israelites went into that practice at times. And so he goes down there, he ta- tears down those high places and those altars, he gets rid of the idolatrous priests, and it says that they celebrate the Passover for the first time since before the time of the judges. And so the Passover was given in Exodus chapter 14. This is like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before. And so they're delivered from slavery in Egypt, and they have this festival that commemorates it and marks who they are as people. This is supposed to be their identity, their Exodus people, their Passover people. And they haven't celebrated it in hundreds and hundreds of years, throughout almost all of the kings, apparently. And so you see what Josiah is doing. He's creating this environment where he's remaining faithful. He's getting rid of the false gods. He's renewing the covenant. He's reading God's word to the people. He's reinstituting these rhythms of worship and these festivals so that they can worship God. It's like this intense environment of renewal and restoration and revival. And if you look at the timeline, that's where these kids came from. This is where they came from. You want to know where they came from? What happened to them that made them like this? They came from this environment. You know, I don't think it was that they were just anointed by God with the power of faith and resilience. I think this is something that was formed in them. It seems like it. You know, they're children of this revival. They're children of this restoration. They're children of a culture that turned their hearts from idols to God, and they saw it, and they were formed in that fire, and here they are in the halls of Babylon, and it's working. They're acting like that. Resilient disciples. They were formed probably when they were five, six years old under the leadership of of King Josiah and their priests. And now here they are in a different culture, in a different place, under the, the threat of death, being light and being salt, being resilient disciples, being penetratingly engaged in the culture around them and yet remaining radically distinct and refusing to worship the gods that are put in front of them. And I think that this is one of those things that we have to look at and we have to understand that if this is indeed what we are called to be like, it means that we have to be formed into it. It's not just gonna happen. You know, they did not come to the moment of worship this idol and have to be formed in that moment. The reason they remain faithful is because they were already formed. The question in those moments where the gods are staring you down and you have to ask yourself if you're gonna give a piece of your heart to them or if you're gonna remain pure to your God, the question is not will you be formed in that moment, the question is are you already formed? If you're not, you will succumb. The gods are powerful. The temptation is real. And so we have to be formed. We have to take this kind of formation seriously for these moments. You know, we're about to um, watch the Olympics, which I love, like I love the Olympics. And one of the things that's so interesting about it is it's these kind of like seemingly obscure sports that we don't watch very often. And yet the people that are competing, they do these sports with such brilliance and technical proficiency. They're so good at it. You watch them do these strange sports and you're like, how can they do that? And the answer is that they have trained their whole lives to do that. The answer is that they have been formed to be people who can do that. So I was talking about my sister earlier and she was an amazing diver. Um, She she was a, a world champion when she was 14 years old. Um, She went to Germany, and she won the world championships when she was 14. She was a three-time high school state champion. One year, she was runner-up. I don't know what she was doing that year. (laughs) She went to Purdue University. She was a five-time Big Ten champion. She's an All-American. She's in the Purdue Hall of Fame, Athletic Hall of Fame. And she dove in the Olympic trials. And one of the events that she did was, it was called the 10-meter tower. And so it's quite literally 33 feet above the water. And they do, like, flips off. I mean, it's nuts. And she would... She would walk to the end of the tower and she would turn around backwards and she would do some kind of like rhythmic thing and then she would fly off of it and do like four flips and three twists and she would go into the water with no splash. And you watch that and you're like, how in the world can she do that? And there's certainly physical gifting that's required, but I lived with her. I was her younger brother. I, that's what she did. That's, who she, that's what she trained for her whole life. Like, if I could tell you this, when she got to the end of the tower and turned around, it wasn't like, all right, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. It's too late. 
either you know how to do it and you're formed to do it or you're not. And the results will show. And I think that that's true of our faith too. You know, I mean, we're all growing and so perfection is not demanded of us. But, but it is true that today, tomorrow, this week, you will stare down these kinds of gods. You will. And the question is whether we're formed in order to remain faithful, in order to be engaged in culture and yet remain distinct from culture because we don't worship those gods. Can we plant our feet in the ground and stare those gods down and say, we will not worship your gods, we will not bow down to your idols? I think that the question is actually, are we formed when those moments come up? This is not very far away from your life. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about anything that you and I would look at and think is particularly like dramatically violent or something like that. Think about your job. You know, like how, how far will you chase the money? Will you do whatever it takes? Will you do what's required? Will you give a little bit of your, you know, will you compromise a little bit of your morality here, a little bit of your morality here because the end is worth it? You know, I actually think that like careerism and that drive to success is a powerful enough and normative enough God in our world that you will not stand firm unless you are substantially counterformed against that. I think it is that powerful. I think it's a real God and it stands there in front of us, some of us almost every day, especially if you're young and you see yourself ascending the ladder of, of career. You see it in front of you. Think about your relationships. When someone in your life that you care about hurts you, someone um, betrays you, someone is, is you know, uh, mean to you and you feel that, like, will you, will you retaliate? Will you be retributive? You know, I, I've, uh, I've shared this before in vulnerability that I, uh, I do watch the Real Housewives series. And uh, I'm only a little bit ashamed of that, but one of the things you hear a lot from them is you'll hear them say things like, you know, I'm a good person, but you do not want to cross me. And it's like, is that who we're going to be when, when we get crossed? Or, like, we're, or, or will we be formed into people that literally turn the other cheek, that, that seek and make peace? Will we be formed into people that are able to take that urge to retaliate and to actually instead love that person who you would normally consider your enemy? The answer to that question is you will never do that unless you are substantially formed to do so. And I think that that's true of all of these things that come before us, that, that we find ourselves staring down every day. And one of the beautiful things as you continue to read the book of Daniel, you get to the end, and you get to Daniel chapter nine, he's like an old man. And he's been there for like 50, 60 years in the halls of power, penetratingly engaged in the culture and yet remaining his distinctiveness. And you read this passage that you probably fly by normally, but I think it's instructive for the purposes of today. Daniel chapter 20, or ch uh, chapter nine, verse 20, it says, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. So, so whenever you read this, you wanna talk about Gabriel and what that means, but we're not gonna talk about that. And what we're gonna talk about is this idea that 60 years later after all that, here he is on his knees, praying for his own sins, praying for the sins of his people, praying for the holy hill of his God, which is Jerusalem. And he's doing so at the time of evening sacrifice, which is uh, one of the rhythms of worship that is in, instituted in Exodus 29, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And here he is, 60 years old. He's maintaining these rhythms of formation, these rhythms of discipleship, these rhythms that, that make him who he is. And one of the beautiful things about the church is, is you look at a church like this and it's like the only reason that we exist, I hope people understand this, is to try to facilitate uh, ourselves and the people that come into to, to this community to facilitate the formation into resilient disciples. And so when you think of rhythms of worship, Sunday mornings, you think of small groups, you think of your own lives and reading the scriptures every day and being in the word and actually being in prayer. Like prayer is not where you just give God a list of things you want 
want. It's real communion where you seek his face and you seek his presence. And this kind of thing over time, habituated into your life, has the ability to form you into people like you read about in this story. These rhythms of worship that you see Daniel still practicing when he's 60, these are the things that formed him into the 18-year-old that, that stood there and said, I will not eat that food. Those rhythms of worship, those things, that, that intentionality of formation are the things that allowed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stand before a blazing furnace and to say, you can throw us in there if you want, but we are not going to worship your God and we're not gonna bow down to your idols. And so one of the things about our life, as I stand here and, I, and I'm 33 today and I think about what God wants for me the rest of my life and what he has for me, you know, part of the, the answer to that question is whether or not I am willing to commit myself to that kind of formation. Am I willing to do what it takes that when the moment comes and when I stare at that God, that shiny God that promises me salvation that is not Christ, Am I doing what it takes? Am I intentional enough about my formation that when that moment comes, like a reaction, like something I've trained for my whole life, like my sister standing at the end of a diving board and doing flips off of it, can, can I stand there and look at that and say, I will not worship that. And I will not give my heart to that. And I will not turn away from Christ. These are the questions. And yet the inspiration of this is that it is possible, you know, like, if, if what I'm saying is true, these were just kids. And yet in the halls of power, this is what they did. And you wonder if it matters. Does your life matter? Do, do, does it matter if you really like stand up to these things? Does it matter if you are a resilient disciple in these moments? And you ask yourself, does it matter if four teenagers are in the halls of Babylon 2,000 years ago? And one of the things that you, you, you understand from the rest of the history of Israel is that they remain in exile for like a really long time. These are the stories they tell. These are the stories they tell to inspire themselves. So ask, does it matter? I, I think it matters a lot. I think this is the inspiration. I think for the rest of exile under the Persians and under the Medes and under the Greeks and under the Romans and under the Syrians and under all of this, these are the stories that they tell. And so these kids, they did that. They did that, they were formed into that and they did that. And we all have that opportunity in our day-to-day -day life. You, you, you will never realize, unless you're looking for it, how many times those gods pass before your eyes. How many times those moments come where you make a decision of, of radical distinctiveness while engaged in the world or compromise to the world. A little bit here and a little bit there. And yet as a community with each other, with the support of, of everything that we have here, we do have the ability to enter into that kind of intentional formation. And we really can be people out there in the world that are salt and light, penetratingly engaged in that world that you walk out into right after this, and yet radically distinct, able to retain your saltiness while simultaneously shining your light. It's possible, it's real, it can happen. And I think that this is what the call on all of our lives is. You know, this is what we're called to after we believe. This kind of formation, intentional, in order to stare these gods down and to be the church. And uh, the fact that we have that ability to participate in that kind of transformative way is perhaps the most inspiring thing that I've ever come across in my life. And I hope and I pray to God that it continues to be a burden that I, that I want to pursue. And I pray that for all of us. Um, and so we have that ability. We have that, that, these moments in our life. And uh, this is the call. And so let me pray for us. God, um, we thank you for this uh, beautiful book that you've given us, this revelation of history of your people that show us what it looks like to engage in this world as disciples that we're called to be. I pray that you give us the ability and, and that you give us the spirit of power that can transform us into this kind of person that we can actually become the, the resilient disciples that you've called us to. And I pray for this church that we can keep in step with the spirit and cultivate the soil that promises to grow the fruit of the spirit from us, from the church. And, and I just pray that you strengthen us and inspire us and that we can inspire and strengthen each other to go out into the world and to see these kinds of gods, to, to stare them down and with full assurance of you and full faith in you, have the ability to uh, be who we're supposed to be 
and be who you called us to be, God. We thank you for, for this life and we thank you for this moment and, and every breath that we have. Uh, it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll uh, come back next week. We're, we're beginning a new series called Iris. It's called The Widest View of the Church. And it's going to be an interesting series about what the church looks like and what the church is supposed to look like. And so we'll see you guys next week.